Well, when I was a kid, uh, there was a period of time uh, where I would walk and talk in my sleep. And uh, my mom has told me the story of finding me often in the bathroom in the middle of the night, standing on the toilet and growling. Now, so she would, you know, wake up and what is going on? And she would come in the bathroom and there I would be. And when she would try to talk to me, I would just growl at her or something until she would tell me, just go back to bed. And then I would just go back to bed. Like I just got down from the toilet and I went back to bed. I did. I confirmed this story with my mom this week. This is a real thing that would happen to me when I was a, a kid. And, and this has happened, you know, periodically throughout, not just when I was a young kid. When Kristen and I were married early in our marriage, there was a night where I sat up really abruptly in the middle of the night and I shook her awake and I reached out my hand and I said, my name is Ryan Luntzert. It's nice to meet you. And I shook her hand and I went back to bed. Uh, she often reminds me of this uh, to this day. Just recently, get this, just recently, I woke up in the middle of the night, or I thought I woke up. I didn't know what was going on, but I woke up, and I swear, Tyler Gano was standing next to my bed. <laughs> now, if you don't know Tyler, he's, he's part of our church here. He, he, was, he was, were you in my room on Tuesday on a, like at 2 a.m.? Because I swear, Tyler was standing next to my bed, and I was freaked out. So I grabbed my pillow, and I threw it across the room, thinking that would take care of it, and, uh, because Tyler's soft. And I figured, well, I can knock him over with a pillow. <laughs> Just kidding. But I went back to bed and I woke up the next morning. I'm like, oh my gosh, was that real? Did that actually happen? Did I actually throw a pillow? And I got up to go to the bathroom and there was my pillow across the room, right? It was so weird. Seriously, Tyler, were you in my room? Where are you, man? Were you in my room? No, you weren't in my room. All right. Now look, now here's the thing. I've had some strange things happen in my sleep. You maybe have too. Or maybe you live with someone who has strange things happen in their sleep. But there's one person that I'm, I'm, I know of uh, that happens to have one of the strangest things happen to him in his life. He's one of my all-time favorite comedians. His name is Mike Birbiglia. And Mike has garnered the public's attention over the last couple of years because he is one of the best storytelling comedians in the world. Uh, he most recently did a show on Broadway and then traveled the country, The Old Man in the Pool. And in his special that was released a few years ago, the new one, Birbiglia tells of one of the most outrageous stories I've ever heard of somebody sleeping. He tells about the fact that he has this sleeping disorder called REM sleep behavior disorder. Essentially, when Birbiglia goes to sleep at night, he has the very possible chance of severely injuring himself. The sleeping disorder will cause him to do things that nobody would ever do in their right mind. Nobody would ever do it. And so this outrageous story he tells happened one night in Walla Walla, Washington. And Birbiglia was there to do a show and he went to sleep one night and he woke up bleeding on the front lawn of the La Quinta Inn he was sleeping in. Now come to find out, shortly before he woke up on the front lawn bleeding, he had thrown himself through a window of the second floor. And he was dead asleep during the whole time. He walked out the door of his room and threw, and threw himself through a window. And I don't mean like an open window. I mean like a double-paned window. Cut his leg, had to have 33 stitches, glass all over him. And today, Berbiglia tells the story that he takes medication for this disorder. But also at night, he sleeps in a full sleeping bag zipped up to his neck. And he wears mittens to bed because he might do something crazy again in his sleep. Now, I tell you all this, and you may be wondering, what does somebody jumping out of a two-story building in the middle of the night have anything to do with the book of Acts? Well, I promise you that it actually does, because crazy things happen when we're asleep. I mean, you, you've woken up from dreams before, right? And went like, what was that all about, right? Which dreams are weird, because it's you telling you a story that you would never tell anybody else. It's bizarre. The crazy things happen when we're asleep. And believe it or not, Bright Perbiglia wasn't actually the first person to fall out of a window while he was sleeping. Okay, so with that in mind, grab your phone if you haven't done so. 
Uh, open up the YouVersion Bible app. You can follow along with everything I'm going to cover this morning. Or if you've got your Bible with you, we're going to be in Acts chapter 20. Jumping into Acts chapter 20 today. Now, last week, uh, if you were with us, we left off with Paul leaving Ephesus after he spent more than two years in the city. And his time there is some of the strangest that he has in any other city. From millions of dollars worth of magic and sorcery books being burned into a riot uh, filled with 25,000 people in an amphitheater screaming the, the, the shout, great is Artemis, over these little mini silver figurines that this one guy, Demetrius, isn't selling. The strangest things, dramatic things are happening in the city of Ephesus. And it's Paul's decision and the church's decision for him to move on. Now, Paul is on a mission in this third missionary journey. This is the third time that Paul is traveling through the known world in the Roman Empire in his life. And he is going from city to city, church to church. He's encouraging them. He is teaching. He's preaching. But this time, he has a mission. He's actually going not only to do that, but also to raise some money to bring back to the church in Jerusalem, because the church in Jerusalem is really suffering. They're under heavy persecution. They're very poor. And so he's going around to these Greek churches asking if they will help support this. There's also something about this missionary trip that Paul seems to understand. It seems like Paul realizes this might be my last go round. And so as he goes from church to church, he does something a little bit different than normal. And that's where we're going to pick up the story in Acts chapter 20, verses 1 through 6. When the uproar was over, Paul sent for the believers and encouraged them. Then he said goodbye and he left for Macedonia. While there, he encouraged the believers in all the towns he passed through. Then he traveled down to Greece where he stayed for three months. He was preparing to sail back to Syria when he discovered a plot by some Jews against his life, so he decided to return through Macedonia. Several men were traveling with him. This was, not, this was not normal for Paul. Paul tended to travel alone or with one companion. But in this case, several men are traveling with him. There were, they were Sopater, son of Pyrrhus from Berea, Aristarchus and Secundus from Thessalonica, Gaius from Derbe, Timothy, and Tychius and Trophimus from the province of Asia. They went on ahead and waited for us at Troas, after the Passover ended, we boarded a ship at Philippi in Macedonia, and five days later joined them in Troas, where we stayed a week. Now, Paul, again, is on this mission through Macedonia to Greece to raise money, to encourage the churches. But then he does this curious thing where he doesn't just travel by himself or with a companion. He brings all of these other people from all the different churches that he visits, and they all end up in this one place called Troas. And it's in Troas, this is really interesting thing happens. Now, again, it, it seems like Paul is, is doing something different because he knows, hey, look, this is probably my last hurrah. I'm on my way to Rome. Paul has his eyes set on getting to Rome. He won't get there in the way he thinks he is. But he knows that his days are numbered in terms of traveling the world and going from church to church. And so he wants to gather all of these leaders within the local churches in the area to be able to teach and preach and say everything that he needs to say before he heads to Rome. Now, oftentimes when we read a passage of scripture like this, we sort of skim through it, right? Like there's these names, can't quite pronounce them right? I did pretty good today, I feel like. Last week, I struggled over Aristarchus. Today, I got it right. I had to, I had to work hard at that, by the way. Uh, but we sort of skimmed through it. If you've ever re read genealogies or, you know, just names like lineages, you're just kind of like, I don't know. These are just people. I can't barely say their names. I get the idea. They're just recording this. But in the middle of this passage, there's something that I want us to take a little bit closer look at. Because two of the people that Paul brings with them, I think, are very representative of the kind of church that Jesus Christ came to establish. In verse 4, we're told that two people traveling with Paul are representatives from the church in Thessalonica. And these two are Aristarchus and Secundus. Those names mean nothing to you, I'm guessing. But to a century, first century citizen in Macedonia or Greece, the pairing of those two names was quite scandalous. The name Aristarchus was only given to those who were worthy of such a name. The name means best prince. 
and it was given to those who were a part of the highest level of the social economic ladder. In fact, its name, Aristarchus, is also a derivative of the word that we have, aristocrat. So, because of his name, Aristarchus was very likely from a line of family that was wealthy, powerful, and at the top of the social food chain. A likely leader within the church of Thessalonica. But meanwhile, he's traveling with a gentleman named Secundus. Again, not a name that means much to us in the 21st century. But those in the first century in Macedonia and Greece knew that a name like that could only mean one thing. You would only be named Secundus if one thing were true of you. The name means second, and it was a name that was only given to slaves. In a household, most people would have a first-ranking slave named Primus, and the second-ranking slave was named Secundus. Think president, vice president, right? Now, back in Acts 19, Luke tells us that as the good news is spreading through Ephesus and Greece and Macedonia, he says that it is having a powerful effect in the world. And here, in the middle of this passage of these names of people traveling is this example of the powerful effect the gospel is having in the first century. Those in the position of Aristarchus would never have traveled with a slave in the way that they're doing. Those in the position of Aristarchus would never have been seen in the public square with a man named Secundus. And Secundus would never have had the opportunity to do what he's doing in Acts 20. But the gospel of Jesus Christ breaks the barriers. The aristocrat and the slave, they work together. They serve together, they travel together, and they lead together. And I just want to take a moment to tell you again that if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you are called to stop making barriers. And not only are you called to stop making them, but you are called to be a person who breaks them down. The barriers in our world that separate us, they don't exist in the kingdom of God, or they shouldn't exist in the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of God, there are no racial barriers. In the kingdom of God, there are no economic barriers. There are no social barriers. We are all one in Jesus Christ. And so as Paul is traveling through Macedonia and Greece, it's not just about what he's saying that God God wants to prove and show to the churches he goes to. It's also about the people he's bringing with him. Aristarchus and Secundus are just one example of the many ways that God is bridging the gap between uh, people who have often been separated and created barriers between them, and he's still doing it today. And so with this odd compilation of companions, Paul eventually makes his way to Troas in southern Greece. And it is there that the strangeness of his missionary work continues. Verse 7. On the first day of the week, we gathered the local believers, which by the way, Luke is writing. Up until this point, Uh, He's been writing in third person, telling us Paul went here, Paul went there. And now all of a sudden he starts using the word we. Luke is here. Luke was present at this moment when he wrote this, okay? A little different. Everything else is coming to him secondhand. Here, I was in the room. This happened. I saw with my own eyes. He says, we gather with the local believers to share in the Lord's Supper. Paul was preaching to them, and since he was leaving the next day, he kept talking until midnight. Typical of pastors. The upstairs room where we met was lighted with many flickering lamps. And as Paul spoke on and on, a young man named Eutychus, sitting on the windowsill, became very drowsy. Okay, if you're ever feeling sleepy, don't sit on a windowsill. (laughs) Finally, he fell sound asleep and dropped three stories to his death below. Paul went down, bent over him, took him into his arms. Don't worry, he said, he's alive. 
Then they all went back upstairs, shared in the Lord's Supper, and ate together. Paul continued talking to them until dawn, and then he left. Meanwhile, the young man was taken home alive and well, and everyone was greatly relieved. You know, Paul is known for many things. But his bedside manner, I don't think it was real good. Now, first off, it should be mentioned that this is actually one of the first recorded moments we have in the scriptures of the church meeting together on a Sunday. Now, that was very specific, right? Uh, most people uh, who are Jewish, at least, they met for church on Saturdays. So that's the Sabbath. But the church decided, no, we're going to meet on Sundays for a few reasons. One being, well, a lot of them were Jewish, and so they continued to go to the temple and learn from the Old Testament or whatever and continue those. Paul makes it clear, if you want to do that, you can keep doing that, and so many of them would. But also, well, Sunday's the day that Jesus rose from the dead, and they just figured, hey, look, this makes sense. We're Christians. We meet on Sundays. The problem is that Sundays in the first century in that Eastern culture was a day of work. Everybody had to work. And so you have these people gathering on a Sunday, like we do, but they've all worked a full day. And now Paul comes in and he wants to talk all through the night, right? Now, it's unlike our first century culture. Um, you, if you were Jewish, you would have taken Saturday off from work, but on that Sunday you would have worked. And so they would have had evening services where people spent the day working and whatever trade they had. And then they would come together and they would eat together and they would worship together and they would hear the Lord's teaching, but they also had to go to work the next day. So it was not normal for them to be, you know, teaching and worshiping and singing songs well into the night. But Paul seems to have a lot to say. And again, Paul knows, this might be it for me. I may not see these people ever again. And so he decides, I, I need to tell you everything I can before I leave Troas. I don't want to leave any stone unturned. But as you can imagine, after a long day's work, and the flickering lamps and the warmth of the room, and kind of cozy in there, Right? Paul's going on and on and on. You might get a little drowsy, which is what happens to Eutychus. He becomes a little sleepy. He's a young guy. He probably worked a full day of manual labor. And as Luke records it, he falls asleep on the window where he's sitting and he falls three stories to his death. Now, isn't it interesting that sleeping in church has been happening since the very beginning. Isn't it interesting? And you know what? I get it. I do. I get it. You know, church services, historically, they have not been the most engaging. I mean, maybe you grew up or you've been to a church where you're like, oh, man, I... I cannot keep my eyes open. It's so boring. This is so boring. I am going to fall asleep. It's easy to get a little shut eye when you're in a hot building, listening to some guy droll on about something. And, and you, not to mention, most services are in the early morning hours of Sunday. And so maybe yesterday you did work, or maybe you stayed up a little bit too late, and you came in, and the lights are a little dim, and the pastor's a little boring, and you're just like, man, this is a great time to catch some Z's. Now, I will tell you this. At Genesis, we work really hard to make sure that our services on Sunday morning are engaging and meaningful to all who attend. And I want to say this very carefully, okay? I want to say this very carefully, but here's the truth. I would rather someone fall asleep in church than not be here at all. I say that very carefully, people, okay? <laughs> but I would rather... You come exhausted and catch a few Z's and miss a few things than to miss the whole thing. You know, one of my favorite quotes from Pastor Nikki Gumbel, who's the creator of the course Alpha, he says, sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is take a nap. I believe that wholeheartedly. This afternoon, I'm going to be spiritual. <laughs> so spiritual. That being said... Sleeping at church is not recommended, okay? For one, it will cause you to miss whatever God wants to do or say to you in that moment. But two, it can be very disheartening to whoever is leading the service, okay? 
years ago, and some of you may remember this, but it was years ago, there was a gentleman who started coming to our church who really was down on his luck. And um, he would often come to church and he would sit near the front and uh, about five minutes into my message, he would fall dead asleep, which didn't really bother me until he started snoring. And I mean snoring. Do some of you remember this? Yes, some of you remember this, right? And it became so bad that we actually had to place people near him. So if he started snoring during the service, they would kind of nudge him, you know, like, like you do with your husband, ladies. You're just like, shut up, right? Yeah, like just to kind of nudge him in, in case he started snoring. And truthfully, look, my heart went out to the guy. Like he was in a tough spot. But as a preacher, that was rough, man. That was rough. Not only did I realize that I was putting him to sleep five minutes into my preaching, but I also realized that the entire room knew I was putting him to sleep within five minutes of preaching. I digress. Okay, back to the story, okay? Paul is preaching in the middle of the night. Eutychus dozes off. He falls three stories out the window to his death. And as you can imagine, the service stops. Everybody goes to help Eutychus. And Paul doesn't seem to be all that concerned, though. I mean, he puts his arms around him, and he says, don't worry, he's alive. He's able to revive him somehow. The Holy Spirit is able to give him that power to do that. But here's the best part. And again, I kind of alluded to this earlier. Eutychus, he heads home, right? rightly so, like, dude, you need to go to bed, get some rest. You just died. That's good reason to go get a nice, good night's sleep. And Paul and everybody else, they go upstairs, and they just continue where they left off, Paul's like, okay, nothing to see here, right? Like, let's, everyone back upstairs, I've got at least 45 more minutes of preaching until the sun comes up, right? Again, typical pastor, like, I got stuff to say, and y'all need to hear it, but the whole scene is wild. This is so strange, and yet there's this nugget of truth in here that I believe God wants to speak to us all this morning. You know, I read this passage, I was like, God, you're going to have to you're going to have to work a little bit extra here. I don't know how to preach a guy falling out of a window. That's a tough one. But the more I read it, the more I studied, I realized, you know, when you're asleep, you're at your most vulnerable. If you sleepwalk like I have, you do things and you say things you would never do if you were fully awake. Mike Birbiglia has to sleep in a sleeping bag, pulled up to his neck while wearing mittens and taking medication so he doesn't do something in his sleep that he might regret. And you know, for Eutychus, whose name, by the way, means lucky, <laughs> as soon as he dozed off, he lost control of his body and he fell to his death. Which is why we take the necessary precautions when we sleep, right? Like we sleep horizontal and in a large bed so we don't fall and break our arms during the night. We don't sleep in windows open three stories above the ground, right? Or at least you shouldn't do that. Again, this is fair warning, don't do it. But even dozing off in church, it's okay. You obviously need it. And like I said, I would rather you catch a few Zs here and miss some of it than miss the whole thing. But here's my greater concern. Here's what God, I think, wants to speak to us this morning, is I'm concerned that Eutychus is actually a metaphor for many of us. I'm concerned that you may have dozed off in life and are on the edge of experiencing some serious consequences if you don't wake up. I'm concerned that we have lost sight or have the potential of losing sight of what God wants to do in and through us, and we are just sleepwalking our way through life. Sleep in church if you have to. Sleep in church if you must. Just don't sleep through life. Catch a few Zs here. It's okay. Just don't sleepwalk your way through life. You know, Jesus is inviting you to be in a relationship with him that will make you fully awake. In Ephesians 5, Paul is talking about what it means to walk in the light of Christ. 
And he tells the reader to carefully determine what pleases Jesus and to take no part in living in the darkness of the world. And then he finishes the section by saying this. It's like an exhortation to those who are listening. He says, awake, O sleeper, rise from the dead and Christ will give you light. Wake up. You're sleepwalking through life. And you're going through the steps and the motions and you are regretting everything that's happening. And there is a person who is alive and well who's inviting you into a relationship with him that will make you fully awake to the reality of this world. To make you fully awake that we are broken and sinful and we need a savior to make us fully awake that we cannot do this work work of life on our own, but that we need God's help to make us fully awake that on our own, we just continue to step and trip and fumble and fall. But with God's help in a relationship with him, he lights our path for us. He leads us to green pastures. Jesus is inviting us to be fully awake with him. Sleep in church if you must, okay? Just promise me, do not sleep through your life. Jesus is inviting you to walk in the light of life, to be fully awake to the reality of the world and to the purpose that he has for your life. His greatest desire is for you to fully realize his love for you, to wake up to the fact that the creator of the world came for you. He died for you to make you fully awake and alive in him. He came to give you new life, to new life, to experience the fullness of who God is and what he is doing in the world. Jesus, like Paul, this morning, desires to wrap his arms around you and say to you, don't worry, you're alive. So sleep if you must in church. Just don't sleep through life. Take a step of faith. Accept the the invitation into a relationship with your Lord and your Savior, Jesus Christ. Allow him to make you fully awake. Let's pray. God, I am, I am fully aware that there are days that I just sort of sleepwalk my way through life. And so we are returning back to you this morning. And, and we asked God, Lord, that you you would awake us. That we, that we would never sleepwalk our way through this life, but that we would walk with purpose. That we would walk with love in our hearts because of you. I, I know, God, there are people in this room right now who realize I've been sleeping through life. And I know that their desire is to be fully awake. And so, Jesus, I pray that you'd meet them right now. That they would experience the life that you have to give. They would experience the forgiveness that you have and came to bring. Their eyes would be opened to the greatness of your love and goodness. That God, yeah, maybe we fall asleep or doze off during church once in a while, but God, that we would never sleepwalk our way through this life, but that we would walk with you on purpose, on mission, ushering in the kingdom of God in every corner of the world that we enter into. I'm grateful, God, that Eutychus, that wasn't the end of his story that day. I have to imagine that his life was changed as a result of that that realizing I was dead, but now I'm alive, it changed everything. And it's my prayer, Jesus, that you would bring the dead to life this morning. God, that we would stand before you and worship you fully awake, fully alive. That we would walk from this space walking in your light. 
that we would see with our own eyes where you are at work, how you are changing the world around us, how it is that we can be barrier breakers, God, that we can be people that bring the kingdom of God into our workplaces and our schools and our friendships and our homes. We thank you, Jesus, that you wouldn't leave us in our sleep, but that you came to awake us, to make us fully alive in you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.